So look, I've been tasked with talking about alcohol septal ablation uh, for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and look, as a preamble, we know that uh, this is the most common inheritable cardiac disease, uh, one in 500, with an autosomal dominant variable penetrance. And uh, the highest profile variant is the obstructive form um, with a sudden death in young athletes, often in the media. Now, two, to two thirds of these patients have a gradient across their left ventricular outflow tract, which is either resting or provocable. And the majority of them respond to pharmacological therapy. So less than 5%, and that would be 30% in quaternary centers, require septal modifying therapy. If you look at the pathophysiology of the obstructive form, you get asymmetrical hypertrophy of the septum, resulting in increased velocity across the outflow tract during systole, with the venturi effect and the, the mitral valve uh, is sucked against the, the left ventricle, causing dynamic outflow tract obstruction, diastolic dysfunction, and a mitral regurgitation. And the aims of septal reduction is to reduce the hypertrophy, lower the velocity, and improve those, uh, those uh, effects. When we look at therapy for intracavity obstruction, uh, medical therapy is, is, is well documented uh, with uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and disapyramide. Pacing, I think it's fair to say, has probably failed evidence-based scrutiny and is, not, is no longer first-line therapy. Septal reduction, which would be in 5 to 10% of these cases, um, involves the surgical, um, surgical therapy with the Morrow procedure, which in high-volume experience centres has excellent outcomes, 1% to 2% mortality. Alcohol ablation, first described by uh, Ulrich Sigwart, um, has been around for about 25 years now. Uh, and, is, uh, and has emerged as a, a useful complementary therapy. So the premise of alcohol ablation is to identify the artery supplying the hypertrophied septum, um, isolate it and distill a small amount of alcohol, which is highly cytotoxic, to perform a controlled myocardial infarct in that area. The subsequent necrosis and fibrosis results in regression of hypertrophy, increases the, um, the size of the outflow tract, reduces the velocity, and, and improves the symptoms. Now, when we look at septal reduction, um, we don't have long-term prospective, prospective randomized data showing mortality benefits. So the present dogma is it provides relief of debilitating symptoms and progressive heart failure. I think it's fair to say that recent observational studies do show a reduction in mortality back to those of the general a HCM uh, population of about 1.6 a year. There's much longer follow-up with surgery than alcohol ablation. There has been some concern about the prorhythmic effect of the al alcohol ablation scar. Now, a couple of smaller trials a while back did notice an increased uh, incidence of um, prorhythmic events. This hasn't been noted in the meta-analyses or re recent observational studies, but the, the guidelines do reflect their concern with this. If you look at the the 2014 AHA guidelines, uh, they, they mandate myectomy is preferred unless contraindications exist. The Europeans have taken a, a slightly different approach and they, they're mandating septal reduction by whatever form, but they do note that obviously there's surg surgical specific <coughs> indications um, and uh, surgery is, is preferred in young patients. So it's a bit frustrating looking at the data if you, if you do a literature shirt because, search because there's no prospective randomized data. It's a low prevalence, um, small, small amount of patients, and the numbers required will be too high. I think we should view this as complementary and not opposing therapy. But when you look at the literature, there are not many comparator studies or observations. Most of them, there's a wealth of single therapy studies, which I think shows that there's enthusiasm for one or the other in many centers. I think the caveats to all of the literature is the small size, the selection bias, it's heterogeneous, and uh, the length of follow-up is, is often shorter. But I think with alcohol ablation, you have similar mortality when provided by expert, expert teams. There doesn't seem to be convincing evidence of increased uh, sudden cardiac death, at least in the short and intermediate term. There is less gradient reduction with the alcohol ablation. There is a slightly higher pacemaker rate, and there's a higher need for reintervention. So the selection criteria for this, um, you're looking at people who've got um, a resting intracavity gradient greater than 50 or a provo provocable gradient of the same. Septal thickness between 15 to 30 millimeters. Less than 15 increases the risk of ventricular septal defect. 
greater than 30 millimeters is in itself a high risk category uh, for sudden death and also um, observational studies have shown poor outcomes in these patients. You need to have a septal perforator supplying the area so you can actually ablate it. And you need to have an absence of significant mitral structural abnormalities which often accompany hokum, which obviously make these surgical candidates or other significant surgical indications. These are usually older age groups and they need to have failed medical therapy or be intolerant of appropriate medical therapy. So from, from, from my perspective, when we do uh, perform these procedures, I withdraw medical therapy 48 hours prior to enhance the gradient. Uh, we perform this under conscious sedation and analgesia. Um, they do have an infarction. It is a, um, a painful procedure. We place a, a, a five French pigtail catheter end hole in the left ventricular cavity and a guiding catheter in the left main coronary artery. So we get simultaneous pressure monitoring. We use real time echo and we place a temporary pacemaker in the right ventricular apex, and these days it's balloon tipped to avoid the risk of um, complications. So with the procedure itself, um, once you've identified a septal perforator you feel is appropriate, you, you, you pass um, a guide wire and a small balloon, uh, which is then um, inflated to occlude uh, the septal perforator. You need to make sure that you don't have any reflux back because there's potential for uh, issues with alcohol refluxing back. And at that stage, you take a shot and see the size of the septal perforator. Uh, and depending on its size, you can decide to go even further into the per perforator into separate branches, which will limit the size of infarction. Myocardial contrast echo um, is a very well, <coughs> is an invaluable tool to actually accurately delineate the site of infarction. We used to use Levervist. At this stage, we use agitated blood and saline. Um, and we, uh, we pass that through the balloon catheter with a saline flush um, and it basically lights up the area which is going to be appropriate to make sure that you're not going, you, you've got the point of mitral valve uh, contact with the septal bulge, which is your target, and you want to exclude other areas, for example, papillary muscles, which could be, cause um, adverse effects and um, larger areas of infarction. This is just um, an example um, of an area which was initially with a large septal perforator which shows a large area of septum lighting up which have been too large resulting in ventricular septal defect. Selective cannulation of a smaller, art, a smaller branch of that artery shows an appropriately sized area at the target point. So when you instill alcohol, I guess the question is why do we use alcohol? It's highly cytotoxic and causes cell death. Um, initial, initially people tried covered stents uh, microspheres and coils, they may cause occlusion and infarction transiently, but the development of collaterals um, really negates the long-term effect. We really reconfirm we have an adequate balloon seal, and then we very slowly in 0.25 aliquots uh, inject um, alcohol into the, into the area. Um, the ECG responds as you would think it does to myocardial infarction with ST segment elevation. Um, we try to use a minimal amount of alcohol to achieve gradient reduction of about 50% and try and get our, um, less, our gradient less than 25 millimeters of mercury. Our experience has been small, super selective amounts of 0.7 to 1.5 mils is usually adequate. Higher amounts of alcohol are associated with an increased risk of complete heart block, ventricular fibrillation and ventricular septal defects. So it's very gratifying in the cath lab to see the reduction in gradient when you've targeted the appropriate area. And you can see at baseline there's a large gradient, and post-alcohol ablation there's, a, there's, there's no gradient, and obviously I've chosen our best case. Um, but but you know, I think it's, uh, you, there's a fine line between them, and on occasion when you have an intracavity a dynamic obstruction, you need to provoke a ventricular ectopic with your pigtail catheter and, and measure the gradient that way. Um, after that, we leave the balloon inflated for 10, mils, uh, 10 minutes. The problem is dropping alcohol into the left anterior descending artery causing infarction, and that's what you're trying not to, uh, not to occur, obviously. Um, you then deflate the balloon and with negative pressure, withdraw it. Patients stay, have a temporary pacing wire in for about 48 hours uh, and stay in hospital for three to five days. So what, what's the mechanism of gradient reduction and symptomatic relief? In the acute phase, you get basal septal stunning, which decreases the outflow tract uh, severity and the SAM. Uh, 
But in the inter intermediate phase, that disappears and you get a partial increase in the gradient, which you should expect. What you're looking for long term is to have thinning, widening and fibrosis of the outflow tract with progressive decrease in the gradient. This just shows our experience at the Toronto General Hospital some years back with 30 patients, just essentially showing the immediate drop in gradient, the slight rise, and then a progressive drop off as uh, the widening occurs in the long term. Complications of the procedure performed in appropriate centres for trained individuals ranges between 1 to 4%. Uh, the most, uh, I think the commonest is complete heart block. And the literature would show you between 12 to 20 percent, and I'd say to you that the highest rates usually occur uh, in the earlier series where certain factors have not been included. The amount of alcohol was much higher in those days, the size of the territory was higher, and there was uh, um, a propensity to, to target multiple septal perforators at the same sitting. We do know that, for example, case selection is very important, and your left bundle branch block um, is likely to lead to complete heart block. The right bundle is often supplied by the septal perforators and is not uncommon to occur with alcohol abrasion. Coronary dissection um, is, is uncommon with meticulous technique. Now, ventricular fibrillation and tachyarrhythmias relates um, to the amount of alcohol, the number of arteries ablated, um, septal thickness greater than 30, and obviously previous high-risk features. There's... there's um, ongoing concern in some quarters about the long-term effects of the scar, and I think uh, we don't have long-term outcomes with this, we have short to intermediate. Ventricular septal defect has been noted, um, uh, even in patients with superselective. Um, it's, not a, it's not a common complication. I know in some centres has actually been managed percutaneously. This is a busy slide and it's not intended to scare anybody, but this is um, the, a meta-analysis of studies comparing alcohol versus surgical myectomy in those patients where there was more than three-year follow-up. And in essence, there has been no increase in sudden, sudden cardiac death. There is a slightly less reduction in the gradient. There's a slightly increased need for reintervention, re re and there's a slightly increased pacemaker rate with the alcohol ablation group. Um, I just thought I'd highlight some uh, good local data we have from Connor Roney and Darren Walters' group in Brisbane. Uh, they looked at 70 patients with alcohol, 47 of which had alcohol septal ablation and 23 with a surgical myectomy. Um, obviously, this is a non-randomised observational group, and they had their follow-up out to 3.8 years. Now, there was similar mortality in both groups, and interestingly, a similar pacemaker rate. Um, as the, as Evidenced by the rest of the literature, there was less gradient reduction and SAM with the alcohol group, and they were more likely to have repeat intervention. So how do we optimise outcomes with alcohol ablation? I think the, in the transcatheter era, the era of the heart team has really intensified uh, and become a lot more apparent, and I think that case selection is, is vital in these cases. And I think it should be done with a heart team uh, with knowledge of both the surgical and the alcohol approach. Um, and ideally through a Hokum clinic. I think operator in institutional volume always reflects um, better outcomes. And we need to pay attention to issues like lowering the rate of reintervention and pacemaker insertion. Uh, and my feeling is that using smaller amounts of alcohol directed by myocardial contrast echo and subselective ablation will reduce the likelihood of pacemaker insertion. So I think in conclusion, it's a promising and effective mode of septal reduction for Hokum refractory to medical therapy. I view it as complementary to surgery in selected cases. Uh, there are similar outcomes to surgery in the short and the medium term. I think long-term observational data is accruing, and, and I think it would be interesting to see. Um, and I think there will be improved outcomes with a selective, minimalist approach. Thank you very much.